Thank you. So let's talk about uh, again Bluetooth. Uh, may maybe so, some of you know that uh, I'm used to this uh, protocol. You know. So who am I? I'm a security evangelist at Digital Security, which is a French uh, IT security company focused on IoT. And I'm also a senior security researcher and the main developer of BTD Jack, which is basically a BTD Swiss Army knife. So we are going to talk about BD5. So BD5 is a new version uh, of this uh, Bluetooth Low Energy Protocol. The Bluetooth Low Energy Protocol has been designed and introduced in 2010, 2010 as Bluetooth Smart, uh, as part of the Bluetooth Core specifications version 4.0, and it has evolved since then. Since then, sorry. Uh, yes. Um, Version 4.1 has been released in 20, uh, 2013, version 4.2 in 2014, version 5 in 2016, and 5.1 in yeah, this year. So this is a, a protocol that evolves very quickly, and it's quite interesting. This protocol includes a lot of security features and security mechanisms. The first one is the, the pairing. This is a process that allows uh, any device to exchange a key with a pin code um, out of band data or in the latest version 4.2 with the ECDH uh, protocol. There are some, some vulnerabilities in this, uh, uh, in this uh, pairing mechanism. But this protocol also provides a secure connection. So this is a, uh, um, a built-in feature you can use to protect the data exchanged between two, between two devices. So this is quite interesting because it's encrypted and authenticated. So basically nobody normally can tap into a, a communication or in, inject packets in uh, an existing communication. <laughs> The last security mechanism, well, in fact, it's not really a security mechanism. It's something that has been introduced in BAD to improve the what's called the coexistence. That means, as many of you may know, the 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth or, or frequencies are quickly uh, a lot used by a lot of devices and protocols. So it's uh, sometimes difficult to make uh, many devices coexist at the same time on uh, this 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequency. So this channel sh selection algorithm is uh, basically some kind of, uh, uh, of uh, not a security mechanism, but uh, a feature that has been introduced in BAD to perform some channel hopping that makes everything complicated. So basically it's, it has been introduced in this protocol to, to make it more reliable. But in fact, uh, from a security perspective, it's also more difficult to tap into an existing connection, for instance. This BAD protocol has been uh, yeah, pretty much attacked these last years. Uh, the first attack that is very easy to perform is a sniffing. That means if uh, an attacker is around a device, um, a pair of, dev of devices, then he can sniff an existing connection, uh, existing connection if it's not encrypted, of course. And by sniffing this connection, he can grab secrets and data. <laughs> Uh, until very recently, this uh, sniffing me uh, mechanism or sniffing attack was only possible with some very specific tools, and it was it, it didn't work on BD5. But uh, some uh, guy at NCC Group released uh, very you know, a few months ago uh, a new tool called Sniffle. And Sniffle is able to, to do this on BD5. But the fact is that this, uh, this tool, Sniffle, can only sniff new connections. Because with this protocol, when you connect, when you create a connection between a, a device and a, another device, there is a, a specific packet sent. And this Sniffle tool is able to capture this packet and follow the connection, even if the, if the communication with BAD jumps from one channel to another. Jamming, this is something I introduced last year at DEF CON. Jamming an existing BID connection, it's possible. If you are synchronized with an existing connection, you can just inject packets by exploiting uh, or abusing a, a very specific feature called the uh, supervision timeout. So I won't go into the details of this, uh, this jamming attack, but uh, it's something that is feasible and it works on a lot of devices for BAD uh, for uh, versions of this protocol. 
Hijacking, it's quite the same. We are going to jam a device and then we could take, we can take a complete control of this existing connection. So basically we just disconnect the master connected to the slave device and we take its place to keep the connection open. And then we can do whatever we want with the slave device. So these three attacks are pretty well known. And it works, um, it works on only on the uh, BD 4.0 to 4.2 version of this protocol, except for the sniffing, which is uh, now possible with BD 5. But what about jamming and hijacking? When you are performing the sniffing or jamming attacks or hijacking attacks, you got a lot to do. And uh, you, you need some specific hardware. Um, you can buy a, a lot of hardware, but the most used in this uh, process are the following. The first one on your left is the, uh, the Ubertooth. So this, this Ubertooth uh, is a specific hardware with an SDR that is able to capture packets and process uh, BD connections. The tool in the middle is the mi BBC micro uh, device which has been sponsored by the BBC in order to teach uh, English students or UK students how to code. But this uh, microbit includes a very specific uh, chip, uh, a system and chip uh, created by Nordic Semiconductor, which is uh, capable of uh, communicating with BLE. So this is something you can just uh, abuse in order to, come to, to capture packets and inject packets at, as well. And the last one on your right is the uh, a TI. CC uh, Thompson development board that is used with sniffer to capture and, uh, and sniff basically uh, BD5 packets and BD4 packets as well. So if you get one of these, you can perform attacks on BD connections. BTD Jack, this is a software I developed, only works with microbit and this uh, Nordic semiconductor NOF 51A22, which is basically limited because it has been designed for BAD4 only. So, we are, as, we are, uh, as we will see later, this is somehow uh, some, some kind of issue we, we will run into with BAD5. <laughs> BD5 introduces a lot of new features too. So, a better throughput, that means you can send data uh, faster than with BD4. Uh, a better range, you can send data further with some uh, specific features up to 800 feet or 240 meters away. So, normally a BD4 connection is the uh, is working uh, up to maybe between 20 and 40 meters uh, for a connection. So depending on the uh, you know on the noise so this is a this is a, an improvement of this protocol and it's also improved the coexistence so that means basically with BAD4 when you get uh, during a conference for, for like this one when you get a lot of people with the BAD enabled devices then you may lose your connection or existing connection or you may experience some trouble connecting to a device because there are too many devices in the room and these devices are interfering with one with each other so this is a, some, sometimes very difficult with this improved coexistence it's easier to keep a connection alive because they improved this uh, frequency or channel hopping mechanism. The better throughput is possible thanks to two new files. So a file is a, a physical communication layer used in, a, uh, in radio. So this uh, two new files, the first one is a two megabit per second, two megabit yeah, per second encoded file which doubles the speed of BLE. So if you are, if you are used to BLE4, um, you know that sending data takes some time. And with this new version of BLE5 and this new file, you can send data um, with a, with a <laughs> can send data faster. So another file has been introduced, the LE coded file, which is uh, yeah, a bit messy. If you do, we're going to, to, to have a look at the uh, packet, uh, the slide uh, after. But in fact, it increased the range. So you can send packet further. But the drawback here is that you cannot send packet further with a high speed. You need to downgrade the speed to be able to, be able to, to send packet further. So yeah, there are two, two possibilities here. The first one is to have a, a range 
multiplied by four, so the up to 240 meters. But you have to send data at a bit rate of uh, 125 kilobit per second. You can send data at up to 100 meters and so, but uh, you, you can send this data at uh, 500, and 500 uh, kilobit per second. So this is uh, faster, but you cannot go uh, as a, yeah, cannot go f further with this uh, this version of file. If you have a look at the packets, the first one at the top is the uh, coded file, so it's uh, much more complicated. And of course, when you are dealing with packets from the air, it's difficult to to capture this packet. The packet at the bottom of this style is the um, legacy BID4 packet. And it's yeah, much simpler. <laughs> if you have a look at this packet, you will see that the, uh, they both use a preamble, which is in fact a succession of zeros and ones. An access address. The access address is a 32-bit value that identifies a link between two devices. So this is something advertised by uh, both devices when a connection is created. And you get the PDU. PDU is basically pay the payload, the data you are going to send from one device to another. And again, there is also a CRC, a checksum, that is used to yeah, check if the connection is reliable. If you get some bit uh, flipped or something like this, you can detect it with uh, this checksum. The improved coexistence. Now, this is uh, the key point in my talk. Um, Normally, when you are creating a connection with BD4, you are using the, what's called now the channel selection algorithm number one, which is the yeah, legacy one. This channel selection algorithm basically uses uh, uh, some kind of counter to uh, compute dynamically the channel number you are going to use uh, for the next hop. So we are going from one channel to another with this mathematical sequence. But this is very basic. You get the, uh, the previous channel, you add some, some value called up increment. So this is a value set up by the master who creates the connection. And then you compute the mod 37 and you get the channel index you are going to, to use for the next channel. So since it's pretty basic, this uh, explains also uh, why in the uh, very crowded area there are a lot of collisions on, on this uh, uh, of packets. So they decided to implement a new channel selection algorithm based on a PRNG, a pseudo random number generator. And the, the more, this channel selection algorithm is more random and uh, uh, in fact, this statistically, statistically yeah, improve the coexistence of uh, devices. If you have a look at the packets sent by the devices that advertise, and this is the case of most of the BLD devices, there is a bit that has been had added to the uh, header they call the CH cell bit. And if this bit equals one, then your device supports the new channel selection algorithm. So you can tell when the device advertises if this device supports this new channel selection algorithm or is, if it does not. So this is quite interesting. So just to, to sum it up, what are the consequences regarding uh, existing attacks? So, uh, so we got a new channel selection algorithm that changes um, drastically the way the a device hops from one channel to another. So basically, we got um, with this new channel selection algorithm a sequence of uh, 65,536 ch different channels rather than 37 for the previous version. So a sniffing new connection is, is still possible. If you capture the um, connection request sent to create the connection, to initiate the connection, then you get everything you need to start uh, following an existing connection because of Obviously, the master sends everything uh, required, uh, every parameters that are required to follow the connection for the save. So if you are here or around uh, the, the devices when the connection is created, then you can get everything uh, you need to follow the connection. So this is what Sniffle does. But we won't be able to jam or hijack B85 devices because previous attacks, such as jamming and hijacking, are based on the previous channel selection algorithm. So the main question is, are B attacks dead? 
Is it possible nowadays, or in the, few, in the, in the future years, to jam or hijack BLD devices? Um, well, the short answer is maybe yes. When I had a look at the specifications, I stumbled upon the BAD5 PRNG, this pseudo random number generator. And um, it looks very nice, you know. Um, first of all, it uses what is called in the specifications a channel identifier. And it's, it, uh, this channel identifier is used as a, as a seed of this PRNG. So this is quite interesting. This PRNG has been designed to be very easy to implement because, you know, you got to implement this in very tiny devices with a small power computation power. So this is something you need to, to, you need to keep it simple, in fact. So it's based on uh, additions, multiplications, XOR, B permutations. So this is something very easy to implement. And of course, there is also channel remapping because you know if your if your channel is very crowded, then you can decide to not not to use this channel and keep the other working. Uh, this is a very specific feature of the BAD protocol. I won't cover this in this talk, but this is something you have to keep in mind. <laughs> this channel identifier, when you go through the specs, is just a, comp a simple calculation based on the access address. The access address is a 32-bit value sent after the preamble. So this is something that is broadcasted. This is public. And this is uh, very interesting because this, uh, this value, then uh, this channel identifier, is used in combination with this MAM routine. Uh, MAM stands for Multiply Add Mod, which is basically the three steps of this, uh, of this, uh, this routine. But uh, of course, they don't use it only once. The process is a bit more complex, you know. So you get in the, in input on the left um, a counter, which is basically the number of channels you have jumped at a given time. The channel identifier, which is the access address, XOR, I didn't specify, uh, to be more specific, the uh, value of the channel identifier is just bit 0 to 15, XOR bit 16 to 31. So this is very easy to compute. So it's based on the uh, first first step is uh, XOR, then a bit permutation, then first MAM, bit permutation, second MAM, third permutation, third MAM, XOR, and you get your random number, or what is supposed to be a random number. And this is using the channel selection algorithm number two. So this is basically a process to compute the next channel that we are going to, to hop to in order to keep the connection alive. So the first, one, first input is a counter. The second input is a channel identifier. Then we get this random number generation routine. Then we get the, at, the, at the output a random number and we compute the next channel. So yeah, well, so this was a bit like, uh, hmm. That looks interesting, you know. And I wasn't alone. Uh, when I performed this research, I saw that Matthew Green, which is a well-known cryptographer, also spotted this exact algorithm in the specs. So yeah, I, I thought I got something. And of course, you all know that the first rule in cryptography, including PRNG designs, is don't roll your own. You don't create your own PRNG. You don't create your own uh, encryption algorithm. So do, creating this specific PRNG, well, sounds bad. And I see also some flaws here. The first one is that the channel identifier is public, as I said previously. So this is a, a public value, a 16-bit value you can compute based from the access address. So we know this. We are going to hijack or jam a connection. We need this access address value so we know the channel identifier. Next value. As a, provided uh, as an input in this uh, RNG is a counter. Normally, when you implement this kind of uh, pure RNG system, you are trying to use some internal states. This is a specific buffer uh, hidden from the outside. And this buffer evolves from time from time, and then it produces a random value. So if you want to break this, uh, this uh, PRNG, you need to guess the internal state. 
But here, it's a counter. It's something that, in, uh, that is incremented. So this is something that we can guess. And in fact, is it really a pure NG? Um, if you have a look at the function, this is something, a black box function that takes a, a known value at the counter to generate 65,536 different values for a given channel identifier. So this is something where channel identifier is constant and this sequence is fixed. So basically, if you get, uh, if, you, if you look at this with uh, you know, an attacker perspective, this is something that can be broken because you are going to loop uh, on all of these uh, 65,000 values. If you manage to know maybe uh, where you are in the sequence, then it's done. So as an attacker, I consider that channel identifier is known since it's based on access address. We are left with a 16-bit value, which is a counter. So what can we do with that? If we can figure out where uh, the connection is in this sequence of 65,000-ish values, then uh, for, uh, at a specific time, then we can synchronize with the connection and then sniff, jump, and drag. So this is quite interesting to break this PNG. So, how to do this? We are going to guess the counter, the value of the counter. So, as an attacker, we are external. We, are, we, we don't have access to this uh, uh, counter value, so we have to guess it. And the only way we can get information from an existing connection is that is to listen on a specific channel and wait for a packet to, uh, to be received. So, I, I can only uh, tell at which time I get a packet on the channel. And of course, if I measure the time spent, well, the time between two packets on two different channels, I can measure the time spent between these two packets. So this is two information I can get and I can use to break this PNG. The prerequisite for this is to know what is called the hop interval. The hop interval is the basic time spent by a device on a channel. So let's consider that we know this value for this attack. So our goal is to um, try to, to recover the counter value at a given time. So I started to think about an attack. And you know, I'm, I'm quite sure you all know about the uh, and sieves used to compute prime numbers. You know, you get this matrix, you cross every numbers, and you, you eliminate each candidate, and you the only candidates that are left are prime numbers. So this is quite the same. Here uh, is the attack to guess this counter used by your connection. So first, uh, at the very beginning, we consider the um, counter as a value of zero. We don't know the value, so let's pick a random value. So we compute the channel corresponding to this counter. We know the channel identifier. We know the counter. We use the same computations with this uh, uh, RNG within. And then we get the channel. So we are waiting for a packet on this channel. Once we got a packet, we compute the next uh, channel based on the counter uh, with value 1. And we also wait for a packet. If the counter at T0 was zero, then we would have spent between the two, the two packets only one hop interval. So we measure the time and we divide this by the hop interval value. If n is greater than one, that means my candidate is not the counter value. So this is quite easy to just eliminate this candidate and keep the others. And we go like this in, th in the sequence we are previously generated. So we are going to look for um, channels in the sequence with a, a gap of n ops. And based on this, we are go only going to keep the indexes that are basically the, con the value of the counter used to generate this, uh, these channels. So by doing this, we are going to eliminate every uh, candidate that could not have been used to generate this pattern. And we are going to loop. By doing this, with uh, a few loops, we can do it again. And uh, after this, we, uh, we will be left with a single candidate. And this candidate is the channel, uh, the, um, the counter, the value of the counter, when we started the attack at T0. So 
So normally I get a video for this. So uh, I developed everything in Python. Um, at the time uh, I, I started this research, the, um, I, I, I didn't have any B85 device. And I suppose that these devices cost a lot. So I started just simulating, emulating the protocol in order to, to determine if my attack is uh, working or not. <laughs> So here is the script. So this is a, a simulation of this uh, channel selection algorithm number two, and uh, I'm simulating all the whole process. You know, all the channel hop, uh, channel hops, and so on. You can see that we can get some uh, candidates. Uh, here, after two rounds, we get only 21 candidates left, and we go through the process until we get. Uh, a single candidate, and the remaining candidate is the 30,600. While the initial value uh, I set it up in, uh, in this uh, experiment was uh, randomly generated in 30,600. 30, so mm, this uh, this approach, this attack, works to get the uh, value the value of the counter. So yeah, I, I like what the plans come to, uh, comes together. But anyway. So, once we get the uh, counter, that's good. We, we got something very interesting, but we need to, to know the hop interval value because all of this is based on the assumption we know this value, and this is something much more difficult to get. This hop interval value can be computed based on, um, on time differences. We can sit on a, on a channel, wait for a packet, do the same on another, on another channel, and of course, you are going to, to capture uh, various packets with different hubs. Uh, first ones, let's say, will be uh, five hubs. The second one, two hubs, and so on. So the time span between this, uh, these hubs is uh, obviously a multiple of the hop interval. So if you use the GCD, uh, GC, just to compute the uh, greatest, greatest common de um, denominator, then we can get mathematic mathematically this value. So we, if, we, if you get enough measures, then you can deduce this uh, this hop interval. So again, I simulated this uh, this system. So um, it gave me, as you can see, after the five, uh, five measures or six measures, something very uh, reliable. And I, I performed a lot of tests to see if um, for every possible values of channel identifiers and counters, if this is reliable. And as you can see, if you only takes five measures, you get a 95% of success rate. So this is, uh, this is pretty good. If you want to have a 100% percent of success, you need to make 10 measures. So it takes some time to, to, to do these measures, but in fact it works. And the maximum time required here is uh, 178 seconds. So this is uh, a few minutes to recover this value. It can be difficult when you are attacking a live device. You know, you have to follow people. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have to tell people just to, to keep in range of the devices. So this is sometimes difficult to, to do. Anyway. So, based on this, we got the uh, counter recovery mechanism designed here uh, as my attack, and also the hop interval. So, once I, uh, I implemented everything in Python, everything was theoretically working. So, next step is to go in real life. Let's go into implementing some uh, some attacks, these attacks on a web device. <laughs> So I started looking uh, on Amazon, looking for B85 enabled devices. I found a lot of them, but in fact they are not B85 compatible. This is just some Chinese random crops putting a lot of B85 mentions in the description just to attract people and make sales. Anyway, so uh, I got no luck. And to be honest, at, at this time, there is no real, uh, real B85 compatible device. Yeah, every, every, BAD, every BAD devices that I found uh, only rely on B84.2 or 4.1, depending on the, on the devices. So <laughs> that means, uh, basically, I had no target device. <laughs> yeah, so how to deal with that? Well, Nordic Semiconductor created a lot of uh, uh, dev kits, development boards, that you can buy and, develop, and you, it's used to, to, to test your setup with a BD5 device. So I got the firmware from the SDK, uh, I compiled the, this firmware, I put this uh, firmware on two 
dev board. Uh, one is the slave device, the other master device, and it uh, uses the channel selection algorithm number two. So this is uh, something that is quite interesting because we are going to test uh, this attack. And of course, uh, I started to improve the Beetle Jack, BTLD Jack, because uh, you know I, I'm used to it. I know how to develop this firmware, so this is uh, easier for me to, to implement this. So I modified Beetle Jack to compute the hop interval mapping, hop interval value while mapping channels, and also this GCD-based technique to recover this value. Um, I started my attack, or, and as you can see, at the bottom of the of the screen, I get the hop interval value. So this GCD uh, computation works pretty well. So that's great. Yeah, first step done. We got the hop interval value. Next step. Next step, we are going to implement our sieve attack. We are going to eliminate every possible candidate in order to intercept the the, the communication. So I started implementing this attack and. The first one went pretty well. I, um, I went from 65,000 possible candidates to only 250 candidates. So first pass, that's pretty good. Second pass, everything messed up. Zero candidate left. Why? I, I get a look at, at my code, you know, because uh, I'm used to develop uh, late at night. Um, I, I did the same this night. Uh, with the badge, <laughs> to the, you know. but um, sometimes when you when you code uh, very late at night, you do some mistakes, and after uh, a few uh, hours of debugging, it looked like my code took some time to compute something and then get desynchronized from the connection we are looking for. So. I was a bit sad at this moment, so but uh, you know I'm stubborn, so um, I wanted to get it working. To solve this problem, I moved from a sieve approach, which is basically you're uh, doing a lot of rounds with uh, you know eliminating a lot of candidates, uh, to a pattern matching, matching algorithm. So we are going to do first a lot of measures, which uh, won't desynchronize uh, our, our microbyte or microbit, sorry, or our device, and then based on these measures we are going to deduce the value of the uh, counter. So if you, do, if, you, if you take 10 measures, then you can deduce this, uh, this uh, counter and get the value you are waiting for. And it worked. Yeah, I was a bit relieved, you know. But uh, so, first step, we got the hop interval. Next step, we got the counter value. Yeah, so normally everything goes, yeah. As planned, but uh, then came the synchronized step. Um, that means once you get this value, you are going to sit on a specific channel uh, and wait for a packet in order to start uh, following the existing connection. You know, you have to synchronize with the connection in order to jump from one channel to another, uh, the same way that the devices do. You know, so. Uh, this synchronization step failed every time. I ran my, my attack, it failed. And I, I had to look at my code again, develop, yeah, <laughs> created late at night. And there is a big loop. If you, have a, if you look at this, we loop over the 65,000 ish candidates. But on this tiny system and chip, it takes some time to do so. And by doing this, when I exited the, the loop, I was late. And I was 13 hops late. So that means when I started to, sequen to detect a packet and synchronize, then the d real device was 13 hops ahead. So no way I could synchronize with, the, with this connection. So um, I fixed this drift in the firmware. Uh, I'm looking just uh, 30 hops ahead, and I get the connection. I get the packet at the exact time I was waiting for it. And it worked. So let's see what happens with this. So I'm going to capture a connection. In order to, to speed up the video, I, I specify the channel map and so on. So if you are wondering what are, what are the parameters in the uh, command line. So we are going to recover the internal counter, which is the pure energy counter. So as you can see, it can take some, some seconds to, to get 
this value. Yeah. This is the yeah fun part of the demo, you know, when you are using video. I did not edit this video to make it uh, you know faster, but in fact it uh, will be recovered very soon. Come on, oh, ten seconds left. Uh, that would be pretty. Yeah. So we get our counter, and then we are synchronized and capturing data with this channel selection algorithm number two. So that's pretty cool. We got this working. What about jamming? So now that we are synchronized with the device, we're going to mess with it. And to, in order to mess with it, we, are, we need to be able to send packets. So um, I implemented the jamming with uh, the system, as you can see uh, the connection, connection lost. Uh, but in fact, I also got a video. Uh, it's maybe the worst demo uh, in video I made, I have to admit, um, because there are no BLD5 devices out there. So this is a dev board with a LED. I'm going to show you and explain to you what happens. But uh, in fact, don't expect a very amazing demo, uh, like me pointing some uh, sex toy or something like this, OK? Just, uh, no. I want to prepare to this uh, <coughs> to this demo. So, I implemented the jamming process, jamming attack on this uh, dev bot. So here uh, at the bottom right hand corner, you got the video feed of, of the board with some LEDs. So normally, uh, I'm already connected with my master device to this uh, to this dev board, and when the board gets disconnected. LED flips, you know, you know, LED goes off, another goes on. That uh, tells the the developer that the, the connection has been lost, and it awaits a new connection. But the master uh, also de dis detects this disconnection and create a new connection. So we're going to see that. So by doing this, we use the same same attack tool. We get the uh, internal counter again with this uh, this technique I, I created. So we get normally we would get the value of this again some time. Sorry for that. But, mm, yeah, demos. <laughs> Don't expect a live demo with this setup. It's impossible to do it at a, at a conf. So we are synchronized. Let's go jamming. Look at the LEDs. Yep, LED flips, and then. Normally, it gets a new connection, so just, yeah, I, I told you this was not amazing at all. But in fact, this attack works. Uh, this jamming attack works. Uh, the hijacking attack normally works, but I, I got an issue with the dev ball. That means the uh, firmware is somehow very touchy. When you're going to, to uh, to jam, it detects very quickly that the connection is lost. And b um, this is not good for hijacking because we expect the device to have some kind of timeout we can exploit. Uh, you know, we, need, we need some time to disconnect the master, detect that the connection has been cut, and then takes over the connections. And this is a problem here. But in fact, hijacking would work exactly the same. But uh, I, I need real devices to you know, to, to show uh, people that it's possible to hijack with uh, with BD5. <laughs> anyway, so I, I released uh, the uh, version 2.0 of BTL Jack. So for those of you uh, who are interested in giving a shot at this BD5 uh, jammer and hijacker, this is possible to do so. Um, if you install this uh, this tool with a pip, the it, it won't work because the pip uh, has only the uh, 1.3 ver um, uh, version 1.3 of this uh, this tool. You get to clone the the repository and then uh, install it uh, yourself. Uh, why I, I did that because um, it's still experimental. Uh, I need to, to test it uh, more thoroughly you know, with a lot of devices in order to yeah to claim that uh, my tool is uh, uh, working with uh, yeah BLD5 compatible devices. So if you want to give it a shot test with BLD5 devices you may own or you may develop, then use this version 2.0 available on GitHub. So a few words to 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 conclude this presentation. 
Um, Bluetooth Learn AG version 5, and it, especially it's PNG. Uh, this PNG is weak. And uh, as a security analyst, this is somehow sort of something we, we can, you know, we, we can see, we can prove. But in fact, this is not really a PNG. And if you, yeah, if you look at it, if obviously there are some flaws that can be exploited to be able to sniff a jam or hijack, uh, such as the channel identifier and the counter, which is basically something you can recover by monitoring an existing connection. But uh, just to, uh, to make uh, everything in uh, mind context with the uh, Bluetooth uh, SIG, uh, the working group that created this version of the protocol, then um, this PNG has just been introduced to improve coexistence. That means they don't expect the guys who created this protocol, they don't expect to some kind of security improvement from this. What are they, ex they, they were expecting to improve the coexistence. That means to be, to be able to put a lot of devices in the same room. And uh, unlike the BLE4 version of this protocol, to be able to make them communicate without any issues. So in fact, this is not really a security mechanism or security features that has been introduced in BD5. It's just something made, made to, to, yeah, to make uh, everybody's lives easier with BLE. And it's, uh, it has also been designed to, to be easy to implement on uh, very tiny devices and very low power CPUs or MCUs. So basically, they are doing the, the right thing. But in fact, don't expect this uh, PNG to, yeah, to block p security people from tapping into devices. And this is for developers. This is my words for the BID developers out there. And I don't know if uh, there are any, but anyway. If you are using BID5 or BID4 or something like this, use the security features. It's, it's provided by the protocol itself. And uh, as we can see, uh, as we saw during the last years, um, maybe 90% of the devices are still using unprotected and unsecure BID connections. So that the way why, uh, that, that's why the uh, jamming and hijacking attacks work. Because uh, if you don't use this uh, secret connection, then anybody can tap into your, into your connection, sniff your data, and jam your devices, and hijack your devices very easily. Um, for the future of this uh, research, um, it could be interesting to use the new version of Nordic Semiconductor uh, System and Chips, uh, which, are, which is basically the NRF52H40 uh, that provides everything required for the two new files. There are still a lot of work to put BitOject to this platform because it's, uh, yeah, it's quite similar, you know, because it's the same uh, vendor. But in fact, you get to refactor the code and modify a lot of stuff. Uh, but look at this, Marcus Mengs. I don't know if you guys have heard about this guy, Marcus Mengs. Uh, he's the one who found a lot of uh, vulnerabilities in uh, um, Logitech unifying uh, dongles and, and devices such as mice and keyboards. And this guy also uh, has already developed uh, some kind of firmware to perform these attacks on this uh, new NRF52840 chip. So this is something I can maybe use to improve BT jack and make it more reliable for BD5 and BD4 connections. So thanks, Marcus, <laughs> if you're watching this uh, video, maybe here. Uh, uh, anyway, so this is something we can, I'm going to do in the future uh, if, uh, if I have time to do so, in order to, to make this tool more reliable. Uh, I also put all my research materials, such as uh, the scripts you, you saw on the, in the videos. Uh, if you want to have a look at it, uh, if you want to try it, to test it, or to experiment with this B85 new channel selection I got with him, it's available also on GitHub. I also developed some kind of uh, die harder tests uh, just to try to evaluate the uh, PNG, you know, uh, PNG robustness, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's weak, so it, <laughs> it failed mostly all the tests. Anyway, so thank you for having me uh, at Brooklyn. Uh, if you have any questions, I don't know, if you get the mic or maybe we'll do it outside, I don't know. Yes. Larry? Nope. All right. That's, thank you. that's great. Thank you very much.